The Shaping of Gondor Part 5 The Line of Tarandor Chapter 4 The Failing of the Line Kalimatar is supposed to have died only three days after the death of his old friend and ally, King Marwini of the Northmen. The latter were now beginning to be known as the Eothed, after the riverland whence they had now settled, and over them now ruled Forthwini, son of Marwini. Kalimatar, meanwhile, was succeeded in Minas Tirith by his son Anduhur. The new king was possessed of a valor and earnestness like unto his father, and continued all his efforts to consolidate the defense of the seven heartlands against the barbarians across the Anduin. It was with this end in mind that King Onderher sent envoys to Arthedain in 1938. Arafant was still king there, and he had a son named Arvidui. To seal the renewed alliance, and to promote the future cooperation between the two realms, Anderher proposed a marriage between the prince and his own daughter, Firiel. This was readily agreed to, and North went to the princess, arriving in Fornost in Sulame of 1940, and the two were duly wed. Their first son, Aranarth, was born later that same year. Thus was Kalimatar's ambition of the joining of the two royal houses of the Adine finally realized. Yet, as fate would have it, Anderher's success in the north would come as to nothing to the storms looming to the east and south. It appears that the Wainriders opened communications with the Haradrim through some means, for in Urme of 1944, the two barbarian groups managed to bring off a pincer attack. This was both, both grave and unprecedented, although, our, although Gondor had many times faced enemies to the east and south individually, she had the good fortune to seldom be caught between the two at once. Now, however, foreign armies advanced on the Harnan and the Anduin, bent on dealing the Stoneland a fearful blow. Anduhur did his best, to be sure. As early as 1943, Forthwini of the Aethed had learned of the doings of the enemy by way of spies and had sent messages to Minas Tirith, warning of their plans. Accordingly, sentries were posted upriver from Ker Andros and, and around Hjarmenolos with careful instructions to speed any word as to the barbarians' movements, whilst the king readied his forces for battle in Pelennor. A second battalion was assembled to the south in Pelargir, under a certain Ernil, a distant relation of Anderhurs. After a fortnight of preparation, the two companies marched north and south respectively to confront the, he the heathen hordes. Anderher encountered the enemy first. After fording the Anduin and marching across North Athelion, he pressed into southwestern Rovanion, where, in the lee of the Ash Mountains, battle was joined. Because of its nearness to these grim heights, it is often known as the Battle Under the Peaks. Although the king and his men fought with valor worthy of the greatest stories of old, they were beset by two pieces of misfortune. Firstly, it appears that Anduhur's scouts either miscalculated the numbers of the Wayne Riders or else deliberately misinformed the king out of malfeasance. Whatever the case, the Gondorians found themselves grievously outnumbered on the field, and were quickly pushed back to the vales of the Ethel Duath. Secondly, the Wayne Riders had found for themselves a new commander in the form of a huge hulking warrior, clad always in black armor, known only as the Mace. Under the latter's savage charges, the king's troops fell back further and further, attempting to form a defensible redoubt using the spurs of the mountains. Before this could be done, though, an especially vicious sortie managed to cut the king's personal guard off from the rest of the soldiers, 
and envelop him. Under her and his knights fought and slashed furiously, but to no avail. All were inevitably cut down or else riven through with black spears. It is said that the king himself was the last to fall, and that it was the mace himself who dealt the death blow, though it is far more likely that it was one of his charioteers who threw the fatal lance. Underher's body was recovered and spirited away from the battlefield by what little remained of his battered army. It soon became clear that the rout had been even more costly than at first imagined, for not only had the king been slain, but also his two sons. The elder, Artemir, had accompanied his father into battle and had likewise fallen victim to the pikemen of the mace in the final duel. Meanwhile, the younger son, Faramir, having been left behind in Minas Tirith, had ridden in disguise to the site of battle and secretly joined in the fight, only to be brought down off his mount by arrows as well. With these unlooked-for deaths came a tragic end to the line of Tarimdor. The Wayne riders swiftly made to take advantage from their victory and pursued the retreating royal army across Dagorlad and into North Ithilien, killing and pillaging all before them. Near Ker Andros, they made camp and gave themselves over to delirious feasting and revelry, convinced of the totality of Gondor's defeat and of their own invincibility. This proved to be their fatal mistake, however, for they had forgotten Erno and his troops to the south. He had reached and crossed the Harnan, even as Andoher had led his ill-fated march. There he crossed swords with the Haradrim, dealing them a sharp defeat, which sent them flying back into the interior. After allowing his men a day and night to recover their strength, he then led them northward to aid his royal cousin. In a remarkable feat of swiftness, Ernil's army managed to traverse the distance, some 400 leagues in a mere week. As we have seen, he arrived too late, for the battle under the peaks had borne its sorrowful fruit two days ere. And when his legions came into North Ithilien, it was a drunken mob of celebrants gloating over their victory, rather than a dangerous army before him. The outcome was quick and fierce. Ernil waited till the fall of night, then ordered a full mounted assault upon the Wayne Riders' camp. Caught unawares and roused from their tents, the latter had no chance, and it was only when the Gondorians' arms and the legs of their steeds grew weary of trampling and hacking that the dying of the enemy ceased. When the sun rose the preceding morning, it was over a graveyard rather than a battle plain. Very nearly, the entire barbarian force had been annihilated. And never again, after this battle of the camp, were the Wayne Riders able to threaten Gondor and her peoples. Nevertheless, the price of victory had been high indeed. Not only did over 5,000 Gondorian soldiers lie dead in the fields of North Ithilien, but King Onderher and his sons were no more as well. What was to be done? The realm's laws and codes gave no guidance. To be sure, Onderher's one remaining child, his daughter, Firiel, remained alive, but she was living in far-off Arthodyne, and moreover was a woman, and therefore unsuited for the throne. No obvious solution seemed to be forthcoming, and the court quickly threatened to dissolve into confusion. Fortunately, Order was largely preserved by the efforts of one Pellinger, who happened to be serving as steward at the time of Onderher's death. Pellinger was a most able man, and he came from a line of distinction, for his great-grandfather, Huron of Imin Arnon, had once served as steward to Minardil shortly before the striking of the plague. Now he proceeded to take firm control of the situation. He pointed out to the high personages of the court that, in the absence of any apparent heir, the realm risked civil war at the hands of rival claimants at a most dangerous time. Enemies still ranged to the east and south, and the royal armies were left badly weakened by the bloodshed of two great battles. This was clearly no time for a second kin strife. Accordingly, after some debate, it was agreed that there was no alternative 
but to summon the Council of Gondor to settle the question of the succession. This, is, this was easier planned than done, however. Gondor had seen no such great council since the reign of Eldacar five centuries before, and gathering all the great nobles and scions of the royal house from across the realm to Minas Tirith would take much time. During this period, Pelinder invoked the rights of his office to govern in place of the king, so that for the first time Gondor found herself ruled over, not by the king, but by his steward. It would be far from the last such instance. Thankfully, Pelinder governed with a sure and capable hand during his brief stay in power. By Virasay of 1945, all the necessary dignitaries had assembled, and the Council of Gondor began its deliberations. There were many extended mem members of the royal house who might have pushed a claim, but from the start, the leading contender was the victorious general, Erno, who was the great-grandson of Telumitar Umbardakil, and therefore a distant cousin of the deceased Onderher. The council might have awarded Ernil the kingship out of hand, but there came a complication from the north. There Furiel still resided as princess of Arthedine. As we have seen, she had wed Arvadui, the prince heir of that kingdom, and he now proceeded to advance a claim of his own to the white throne, upon the grounds both of his descent from Isildur, as well as his union with the one living child of King Onderher. Or barring that, he proposed, as her father's sole remaining child, should not Firiel assume the throne as ruling queen of Gondor. In the old days of Numenor, women had sometimes succeeded to the scepter after all. This proposal, however, whether logical or not, was to totally unacceptable to those on the council. The governance of Gondor, they maintained, had, sp had been specially bestowed in perpetuity upon the line of Anarion, not that of Isildur. In any case, Arthedain was by now a small, weak kingdom far gone in destruction and decay. Its population was not a tenth part that of Gondor's, and it was far below the latter in terms of wealth, trade, and arts. It was therefore simply inconceivable to place the proud peoples of the Seven Heartlands under the rule of a prince from such a beggarly house. Nor was the idea of enthroning Firiel in his place a palatable proposition. True, Numenor had of old known ruling queens, but she had been an island and had flourished during times of peace and security. Gondor, however, had no such luxuries. She had just witnessed the cream of her armies shattered in the struggle with the Wayne Riders. Harad still loomed to the south of the Harnan. To the north, the kingdom of Angmar remained ascendant. All about her she was beset by threats and foes. This was therefore manifestly not the time for a woman ruler, for she would surely be incapable of leading troops into battle effectively. Thus, Arvadui's claims were summarily rejected in favor of that of Ernil of Pelargir. Pelinder promptly resigned his powers, after a year's rule, acknowledged Ernil as king, and if he ever doubted his action, he gave no sign of it thereafter. Ernil II proved to be a strong and wise ruler, something all to the good, for his reign was not to be without hardship. He demonstrated his sagacity almost at once, when, shortly after his coronation, he sent messages to Fornost to assure Gondor's continued goodwill and alliance. He said, I do not forget the loyalty of Arnor, nor deny our kinship, nor wish that the realms of Elendil should be estranged. I will send you aid when you have need, so far as I am able. It was a vow that would bear fruit soon enough. The early seasons of Ernil's reign, however, were preoccupied with contention with the remaining forces of the Wayne Riders. Although, as we have witnessed, the greatest part of their strength had been wiped out at the Battle of the Camp, sufficient numbers of warriors remained in Rovanion beyond the Anduin to give Gondor much trouble. In 1948, and once more in 1955, the king was obliged to march into southern Rovanion to confront their raiding parties. 
In the second battle, Ernil's fleet cavalry were able to surround and kill the Wayne Rider's chief, Vortimar, neatly reversing the scene of the Battle of the Peaks, which had resulted in the death of King Onderher. With their leader vanquished, the barbarians almost immediately disintegrated into chaos and, fl and fled pell-mell into the interior of Ravanium. Those that were not captured and slain by the king's pursuit met to their ends quickly enough at the hands of the native population, few of whom had forgiven or forgotten their recent enslavement by the Rovai. So came an end to the power of the Wayne Riders, almost exactly a century after, after they had first appeared on the eastern marches. In that time, they had managed to unleash more devastation on the peoples of the Seven Heartlands than any foe since Sauron, and had succeeded in slaying two kings of Gondor. Yet now they were forever done. Ernil, however, did not allow the savor of his triumph to go to his head. He knew where his real strength lay, and like Kelimatar before him, declined to make any effort to recolonize Rovanyan. He instead withdrew back across the fords of the Anduin, and occupied himself for some years with the maintenance of the northern boundaries of Kalanarthen. Alas, though peace is often sweet in its hard earning, it seldom lasts, and Ernil's trials were far from over. Having dealt in masterly fashion with the enemies to the east, he was all too soon forced to turn his attentions to the north, for Angmar, that most patient and relentless adversary, was once again on the move. Old King Arafant, with whom Onderher had treated to arrange the union between his daughter Firiel and the prince Arvidui, had died in 1964, and Arvidui now ruled as the 15th king of Arthedain. From the beginning, it boded to be an ill-starred reign. Indeed, a prophecy had supposedly been made at the prince's birth that he would be the last to bear the scepter of Anuminus. And even the name Arvidui means last king in the tongue of the north. It proved to be a grimly accurate foretelling, for by the time Arvidui took the throne, it was over a kingdom that was very nearly at the point of death. Under the ruthless leadership of the witch king, a sorcerer of horrific power, the armies of Angmar were sweeping all before them. As seen earlier, he had already brought the two other petty kingdoms of Rudar and Cardolan to ruin five centuries before. Now he made to conquer Arthedain as well, and in Sermier of 1974, Fornost was placed under siege. King Arvadui had foreseen this, and had a year earlier sent frantic calls for aid to the west and south. For twelve centuries, ever since the days of Siriondil, kings of the Adain in the north had applied for assistance to their southern kin and had been largely denied or ignored. Now, in 1973, when Ernil II received Arvidui's plea for aid, he resolved to break with that pattern of faithlessness and come through. A large relief force was carefully assembled, and in Virasay of 1975, the fleet of aid set sail from Pelargir for the north under the captaincy of Erner, son of the king. The fleet arrived in Mithlond without incident and was graciously greeted there by the elf lord Círdan of Linden, even as Isildur had once been received by Gilgalad two millennia before. They then joined their two forces as one, as once that legendary pair had once done to form the last alliance. Alas! This new alliance was not to match the glory of that union of old, for Erner arrived six months too late. Fornost had fallen after a siege of four months in Hisame of 1974, and Arvidui had fled to the far north to take refuge in the region of the ice-bound Bay of Porachel. His short and unhappy reign was at an end after but ten years, and it was only the shattered ruin of a kingdom that the elves and Gondorians marched into in the early seasons of 1975. What became of Arvidui is uncertain. Although Lord Círdan sent a ship to search him out and save him, nothing was ever seen or heard from him again. It is likely that the poor man perished, along with his crew, amid the frigid ice banks of the bay. Nonetheless, they did not allow the opportunity to deal the enemy a handy blow to go to waste. 
Angmar's army was engaged at Fornost, and thanks to reinforcements from Elrond half-elven of Imladris, was swiftly outmatched and crushed. Fleeing remnants were doggedly pursued westward, and by the time the men and elves were done, it is said that not a single orc or Angmardrim warrior was left west of the Misty Mountains. The fell city of Karndum was taken and razed to the ground. It was a total victory for the soldiers of Gondor and Lindon, and the kingdom of Angmar was destroyed, never to rise again. The Witch King himself, however, managed to escape, an unfortunate happening that would return to plague Gondor all too soon. It was in victory tinged with sorrow, therefore, that Prince Erner returned to Gondor in 1976, bearing many tokens of thanks from Elrond and Círdan. This set the tone for the remainder of his father Ernil's rule. Angmar was gone, but removed too was the last of the kingdoms of the Adain in the north. So the diminishing of the numbers, strength, and wealth of the peoples of Eriador proceeded all the more speedily. Elsewhere in Middle-earth saw similar, similarly doleful turns of fortune around this time. In 1980, a fearsome Balrog was unleashed in Khazadun, which quickly led to the slaying of its king and the abandonment of that remarkable underground realm by the folk of Durin. The following year, the elven kingdom of Lorenand lost its ruler as well, when King Amroth was drowned whilst attempting to depart Middle-earth by way of Ethelond with his lover Nimrodel. The wood elves of Mirkwood began to withdraw even further into seclusion. Trade and communication between realms continued to dwindle. All about the continent, it seemed, lay the melancholic clouds of tragedy. Nor were King Ernil's labors over. He had had to fight enemies to both the east and the north, and now, after a lull of some years, they proceeded to strike much closer to home. As earlier observed, the Witch King had contrived to slip out of the ruin of Angmar unscathed. Now, after biding his time for a while, he amassed arms in Mordor, where Gondor's gathering weakness had at last reached the point of allowing evil things to return there in force. In 2001, the stronghold of Minas Ithil, the sister city of the capital across the valley of Pelennor, was put under a surprise siege, and although its defenders resisted with everything they had in their disposal, they proved no match for the sorcerer's powers. Minas Ithil fell in Ringare of 2002. Ernil reacted to this desecration of one of the seven heartlands' most revered cities with fury and resolve. He at once raised the royal arms and marched out to retake the haven. Here, however, his list of victories came to an end, for the Witch King's minions fought diabolically, employing every savage attack faint and wild that they could, whilst the Gondorians' dead piled before the gates of the fortress to no purpose. After a few years, the king was forced to withdraw in frustration, with nothing but buckets of blood to show for it, whilst a defensive ring of sentries was positioned around the environs of the city. Osgiliath was also garrisoned anew to safeguard it against incursions from the stronghold that now came to be known with dread as Minas Morgul, meaning Tower of Dark Sorcery. It was a sad and cruel fate, for the once fair and stately citadel founded by Isildur so many years before at Gondor's birth. Ernil persisted, to be sure, in attempting to reclaim Minas Morgul. Years 2013 and 2029 each saw renewed thrusts against the city, but it was in vain. The walls were simply too high and strong, the occupiers too fierce, and the black enchantments of the Witch King too dreadful and otherworldly to overcome. Thus things stood when Ernil II breathed his last in Narie of 2043. He had spent nearly the whole of his life and reign of nearly a century fighting Gondor's foes, always with cunning and forcefulness, and almost always with success. Both Angmar and the Weinreiter realm were now vanquished and scattered to the winds, where just a century earlier they had seemed poised to deliver a death stroke to the realms of the Adain. True, the northern kingdom of Arthabine was no more, 
But she had long been a bedraggled shadow of her old strength, and had been of little use or benefit to Gondor, and few among the folk of the South lamented her loss. Only Minas Morgul and the domain of the Witch King remained to imperil the Stoneland, the sole blemish on Ernil's record of accomplishments. Among the finest of her generals and the most resilient of her kings, his subjects bade him a heavy-hearted farewell. When Erner, son of Ernil II, mounted the White Throne in 2043 as the, as the 33rd and last king of Gondor, he had but one objective in mind, to retake Minas Morgul and put an end forever to the menace of the Witch King and his legion of miscreants. The latter, indeed, stoked this desire even further by challenging Erner to a contest of single combat not long after his coronation. The steward, Mardil Voronwe, the grandson of Pelendur, dissuaded the king from accepting. Ere seven years had passed, however, Ernil's yearning for vengeance had grown apace. He had already crossed swords with the evil sorcerer in the war to the north and had, and had emerged al alive. Why should he fear to defy this herald of sorcery and destruction now? Therefore, when the witch king renewed his challenge in Virase of 2050, the king accepted almost at once. Out to the gates of Minas Morgul he duly rode, accompanied by only a few loyal paladins. Whether they were treacherously ambushed and slain, or were fairly defeated and captured in an open fight is not known. None of the royal party were ever seen or heard from again. Erner's brief reign was over. Like Taranon Falister, Narmakil I, and Onderher, Erner left no son to succeed him. This time, however, there was no obvious alternative heir. There was no victorious cousin general like Ernil, nor any gifted nephew like Minilcar to call upon to assume the burden of the throne. To be sure, many cadet members of the royal house remained alive, but all were of more or less equal distance in relation to the dead Erner, and it was clear that none would willingly accept the supremacy of any of their fellow claimants. None wished to endure another kin strife. Whom, therefore, should rule? Before venturing out to confront the Witch King, Erner had lain the crown of Gondor on the lap of his dead father, Ernil II, in Rath Dinan. He had then committed his authority to the steward Mardil until such time as he returned to Minas Tirith, or else was recovered from his wounds, should the duel go awry. In the interest of forestalling civil war, therefore, it was proposed by the ministers of the court to simply continue this arrangement. There was no certainty that Erner was in fact dead. Perhaps he might contrive a ransom or an escape of some sort. Mardil had meanwhile proven himself a judicious and capable man since the assumption of his office in 2029. Why not empower him to continue ruling in the king's stead as regent of the land, even as once Minilcar and Pelinder had done? To this, the great noble houses of Gondor had no ready answer nor alternative, and the matter was peacefully settled. Mardil Voronwe would govern the seven heartlands until such time as a legitimate heir to King Erner could be found or agreed upon. He was duly invested as ruling steward of Gondor in Hisame of 2050. That office his descendants continue to retain today, some five centuries later, ruling in august serenity from the white city of Minas Tirith. Thus ended the line of kings in the south kingdom of the Adine in Middle-earth. This concludes the shaping of Gondor, as recounted by Falustir Ardinlon, court scribe to Kirion, lord and steward of Gondor, in the year 2558 of the Third Age of the Sun.